Welcome to Concepts of Programming Languages with Professor Califf. Today I want to continue our discussion of parameter passing mechanisms. In the last video, we talked about four mechanisms, including the two most common, pass by value, which is probably the single most common mechanism, pass by result, pass by value result, and finally pass by reference, which is the second most common. In this video, we're going to talk about some other approaches that are all somewhat related, a little more unusual and esoteric, but still out there in the world today. That's macro expansion, pass by name, and pass by need. If we're going to talk about macro expansion, the first thing we need to know is what a macro actually is. It's a code segment, which can have parameters. It gets called just like a function does when we actually write the code. But when we go to actually use it, we're going to substitute the code in place of the call. Parameters are just going to be renamed. The text substitution is going to occur before the code is compiled, just replacing text. This makes things faster than a standard function call, because at runtime, we're just running that code. We don't have function activation records. We don't have to copy anything. We just run the bit of code. So for small functions in particular, this can be very, very efficient. So when we go to actually use these things, we're going to expand them. We are replacing the call to the macro with the text of the macro. That includes substituting the names of the actual parameters, the ones in our call, for the names that we used when we wrote the macro, the formal parameters. Let's look at an example of this. I have here a little example of a program that uses a macro. Macro is fairly simple. We have three parameters. Take the sum of the first two, divide the third parameter by that sum. We have four variables in main. And um, you'll notice three of them are just num1, num2, num3. And the third is named temp, which is going to be significant. So I print out the values of my variables. Then I'm going to call my macro with num1, num2, and num3. Then I'm going to print out that result, call my macro again with temp in place of num3, and then print out that final thing. So let's compile and run that and see what happens. And it got out. And we're going to see that, um, of course, we print the values that we put in, so that's good. Then uh, if we look at this, num1 plus num2 is 5. Num3 is 10. 10 divided by 5 should be 2. So that all worked exactly as we would expect it to. But then with the next one, we have... The same thing is going in, but then we just end up with temp is 10. Nothing changed here. So that's very confusing. In order to understand why this is, we need to see something about how the macro text substitution actually ends up working. It turns out we can see what actually happens very easily because our compiler has a, an option that will show us what the result of the pre-compilation process is, the process where the macros actually get expanded. So let's take a look at that. We say GCC and use the capital E parameter. And we're going to need to redirect that to a result because it by default um, sends or it just sends the output to standard output. So we're going to redirect it somewhere else for our own convenience. And we'll just call that preprocessed. And let's take a look at that output. Now there's a lot of stuff here. Preprocessing tends to produce a very large file, partly because every time you do an include, pound include in C or C++, you're just copying the entire contents of that file that you included into this file. And if it includes things, you're going to copy those in. It can get pretty ugly. But if we come down to the very end of the file, 
we see the actual main, but it looks a little bit different because where we had the calls to the macro over in macro example C, right here, instead we have the expansion. And we see that where there was uh, A before, it has num1, where it had B before, it has num2, where it had C before, it has num3. And so this simply sets up and does temp is num1 plus num2, num3 is num3 divided by temp. So num3 gets modified to 2. But then this one is temp. And so it's behaving a little bit differently. Let's go back over to the slides. We have here the code. I've left out the prints because they're not really important to us. As we look at this, we see that with the first one, we have temp just twice. And it's clear that the temp at the end is the same temp as the one declared inside these curly braces. But what's important to understand in the next one, the same temp is declared in the same place. But then we have this other temp that we want to reference this one, just like the num3 here references this one. But the reality is that these temps are also referencing this one because they're inside these curly braces. This is the temp variable that they can see. This we call capture. So when you're thinking about the capture, what's happening here is that we're capturing the reference that is supposed to be to our actual parameter inside this scope so that instead it is a reference to our temporary variable. Macros are great little things, but you'll notice that they're not much used in modern languages. The key issue for us in relation to macros is this issue of capture. So from a programming languages perspective, that's a problem. Text substitution also really isn't the best approach to calling functions. It can lead to certain kinds of errors. One nice thing is that modern languages often do provide some better options for efficiency for small functions. So for example, inline functions in C++ have efficiency that is similar to a macro, but they are more safe, less prone to the kinds of errors that we can have with macros. Understanding macros and how macro expansion works is really useful for our next parameter passing mechanism, which is pass by name. The idea here is that just like we did in macro expansion, we're gonna do lexical substitution of our parameters. But instead of interpreting the parameters in the scope of the function that we have called, we're going to go back to the calling function and interpret them in that scope. So we're avoiding the problem of capture. So our macro example would work exactly as we would expect in both cases. We would end up with that result of two that we were looking for. In many cases, pass by name is just going to function like an inefficient version of pass by reference. There are, however, some cases where it does behave a bit differently. I also want you to note that this is a very old technique. It actually dates back to Algol 60. So that's 1960. This is the well-known example with pass by name and where it can be useful. We have here something called Jensen's device. It returns a real, the name is sum has four parameters. Low and high are being passed by value. The ones that aren't specified are being passed by name. So J and EJ. J low and high are integers. EJ is real, though I'm going to use integers in our examples for simplicity. We begin with a total that we set to zero. Then we're going to run a for loop from low to high, moving by one and add 
EJ to total. Then when we set sum gets total, this is the equivalent of saying return total. So let's look at a call to this. I'm passing I, this variable, one and five, this array sub I. So right now, if we were to call this, say, like a, consider this to be a by reference parameter, notice that we would not have an, a valid result because this is a language that starts counting in arrays at one. Uh, but that's not that situation we're in. We're in this pass by name, which won't evaluate what the value of EJ is until we actually try to use it. So let's see what happens. I'm going to start through my function and set total to zero. Then the for loop is going to set j, which is the i in the calling function, to one. Then I'm going to handle the right-hand side and the left-hand side differently. Start trying to deal with the right-hand side. We're going to need to calculate what e sub j is. And so we can see that right now, ej is air at i, i is 1, air at 1 is 5. Then we will actually add the ej to the total. Go back to the for loop, we're going to update i to 2. So now when we calculate ej, it's actually 10. When we add it to total, we're going to get 15. Then we raise i to 3. We figure out that air at 3 is 12, so ej is 12. We add 12 to 15, and we're going to get 27. Then we update i to 4. We figure out that ej is now air at 4, so that's 14. We add that and get total to be 41. And then we get to i of 5. Air at 5 is 20. 41 plus 20 is 61. And we assign that 61 to sum, returning the value 61 as our total sum. Now you may be saying, but, but why not just pass the whole array and do this? And there are other ways it could be done. The idea is I've written this one procedure that can do a variety of different things. So let's consider a different call. Now, instead of passing in just error at i, I'm going to pass in i times error at i. Notice that I'm using the exact same procedure, but now we're going to sum up i times error at i. Start at zero again, i goes to one again, one times error at one is just five, so we add five. Move to two. This time we have 2 times 10, so 20, for a total of 25 so far. Move i to 3, air at 3 is 12, times 3 is 36, so we make that addition. Move on to i of 4, 4 times 14 is 56, we make that addition to get 117. And then we move on to 5, 20 times 5 is 100 for a total of 217, which is what we'll return. So we were able to use the exact same code. We can do a wide variety of different kinds of sums here, giving different expressions for that third value. We can even make calls to sum and sum up a two-dimensional space with the same function. So kind of cool in its way. And that is what we consider the elegant part of pass by name. It's a very elegant expression of this kind of calculation. To do this without pass by name generally requires higher order functions, which is how uh, many modern languages do it now. Some of the functional components that they include is to support this kind of calculation. Let's look at another function using pass by name specifically swap. And we can imagine that this would not work well with macro expansion because we do have that local variable that could cause me problems. But 
with pass by name, I avoid that issue. So let's see what happens if we just do this with a couple of values. I'm calling with just two numbers that I have elsewhere. Uh, temp is going to get A. A is num1. So we'll put 5 into temp. Then we figure out B is num2, which is 10. So we put that into the num1 that A is references. We take the 5 in temp and put it into the num2 that B is referencing. Fairly straightforward. The swap worked just fine. But now let's look at a different situation. So let's go back to having an array. I've got an index and an array at an index. And I want to swap those. Don't ask me why I want to swap those. But if I did this by reference, it would actually work just fine. Try a similar thing out. But if I try to do it by name, let's see what's going to happen to us. A is index. So I'm going to put 3 into temp. Then B is air at index. So array at 3. That's the 4 here. So I put the 4 into A, which is referencing index. So I figure that out and I put 4 there. Then when I get to B is temp, I'm going to take the 3 in temp and put it into the current interpretation of air at index, which is air at 4. So the 3 goes here, not into the place we swapped out of. Basically, it didn't work at all. In addition to this issue that we can come up with these interesting interactions if we deal with an index and the array that we're indexing into with it. We have a couple of other concerns with pass by name. One of them is simple inefficiency. If we're going to access the parameters multiple times, each time we access it, we have to recompute what it is. So this makes it far more inefficient than something like pass by reference or even pass by value. We may copy something large, but we're only going to copy it once. This can also be really confusing. This is probably the parameter passing mechanism that gives college students the most grief in their concepts of programming languages classes. It's not that it's terribly difficult once you really understand what's going on here. The biggest issue is that it's very tedious and it takes a lot of attention to detail to keep track of what's going on. It certainly is not intuitively obvious in general. And this is part of why pass by name did not become a major, everybody's going to use this kind of pa parameter passing mechanism. You can do some cool stuff with it, but the principle that cool and efficient is less valuable than clear and easy to understand in general in code also applies to parameter passing. So this is one of the real dings against pass by name. Pass by name, of course, does have a couple of advantages as well. One of the biggest ones is that the parameters are never going to be evaluated if they're not used. So we do have kinds of functions where we might never need to use a particular parameter depending on the path through the function. If we're using pass by name, the parameter that doesn't get used will never get evaluated at all. So it won't cost us any time. Sort of the inverse of the, it's bad if they're used several times. If they're used zero times, it's really, really good. And of course, it can be used to produce some very elegant code. Pass by name is still around today. Some of the ones we talked about last time with pass by result, pass by value result, you really don't see them much. Pass by name is more common. It appears, for instance, in Scala and Haskell. Most of the languages that do use it do not allow assignment into a by name parameter. So they avoid many of the confusing issues. The parameter ends up behaving more like a by value parameter that simply is not evaluated if it's not used. 
The final technique I want to talk about is pass by need. This is a variation on pass by name that works very much the same way. We don't actually evaluate parameters until they are used, and then we're going to take that lexical um, parameter that we received and interpret it in the scope of the calling function. Same kind of thing. However, when we do that evaluation, we're going to save it so that we don't evaluate it again. Pass by need parameters are evaluated zero or one time. If they're not needed, they're not evaluated. If they are needed, they're evaluated only once. This is used for efficiency primarily in functional languages. Note that if we were to pass by value in those circumstances, we always have to make the copy. I hope you found this helpful. Thank you for watching. Parameter passing mechanisms can be a challenging concept, but they are a valuable thing to have a good understanding of. Hope to see you next time.